me introduce our first speakers. We have uh, David Martin and uh, Peter Brown. You're both Red Hat. Uh, yeah. You're Red Hat. You're uh, Red Hat and Earl Gear Org. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're going to present uh, calling serverless functions from an Android app. Now, uh, if you have any questions, they're going to take questions during the uh, during the presentation. They've, they've built that into the presentation time. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know, and I'll come by with the mic. Oh, I should have turned this on. <laughs> I'll come by with the mic uh, to make sure that you, your question can be heard and recorded. Uh, there's no need to get up or walk up to me. I'll just go to where you are and put the mic near you. Uh, so with no further ado, uh, please. OK. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And we're talking about serverless functions, calling serverless functions from an Android app. Um, our presentation will be structured into two parts. So, oh, sorry, let me. The first one will be about running and managing a serverless platform on OpenShift. And then the second part will be about invoking that, that platform from an Android app. So first, let's do a quick introduction into um, serverless architecture. And it kind of sounds like there's no server involved, so how would it work? Uh, so where does my request go, and where does the answer come from? Um, so that's what serverless sounds like, um, but it turns out that's not really how it works. Um, the idea here is not that you don't have a server. The idea is that um, you don't care about the server. You don't have to know how what technology stack your server is using or how much CPUs it has. Um, all you care about is I have my request. My request goes to the serverless provider and at that moment um, the serverless provider will spin up the resources, it will process my request and afterwards it will spin down my resources. So. That's, sorry, I have to move the mouse across. Um, the most common type of serverless architecture is called function as a service. Um, in, in that scenario, you map your requests to single functions. The advantage here is that you, you pay for usage and not for having a backend that is available at all times. So only when a request gets in, um, your function will be invoked, the resources will be available at this time, and they will be deprovisioned afterwards. Examples of this type include uh, AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, and Azure Functions. So let's go on to Apache OpenWhisk. Apache OpenWhisk is, was started by IBM. It implements the function as a service infrastructure. Uh, it's now an Apache project, an open source project. You can write functions in a large number of languages. In, for example, you can use JavaScript with Node.js. It supports Golang, it supports Ruby, and it scales using container technologies. So to interact with OpenWhisk, well, first of all, um, functions in OpenWhisk are called actions. And there are many ways you can invoke an action. You don't have to make a direct HTTP request. You can, for example, define triggers where you say, whenever an email goes in, I want to invoke an action on my serverless cluster. Or you can define feeds where you say that I have a GitHub repository, and whenever someone pushes to that repository, I want to run an action on my, on my cluster. Or you can use AMQP when a message is received, I want to run an action. Um, as mentioned, all those scales with Docker containers. So if more requests go in, it will spin up multiple instances of your function to um, yeah, manage the demand. Okay, usually you interact with OpenWhisk through its CLI. Um, this is how the banner of it looks like, and it gives you gives you examples of what you can do with it. So you can manage your actions, um, you can manage your triggers, namespaces. Namespaces are ways to group functions, and here are some examples or some useful commands that you can uh, that you can use. The first one is just list everything that's in the cluster. This will return you all the actions, um, all the namespaces, all the triggers and feeds that you have. You can also just specifically list actions with WSK action list. Um, more interesting is creating an action. So the simplest way to do it 
is just to use WSK Action Create. You give the action a name and you provide a file. By default, it assumes that it's a JavaScript file uh, and it will be run in a Node.js container. Um, you can create more complex actions where you provide a zip file. In that case, you have to provide a kind to tell OpenWhisk, is this Node.js, is this Golang, because it can't infer the type from the, from the file extension. This has several advantages. So you can bundle your dependencies with your action. You could say, I have, I have one function, but it calls out to a database, maybe. And I bundle the dependencies for this in my zip file. You could just bundle your node modules if it's a node, a Node.js application. On to OpenShift. So what do we want to achieve? We want to run OpenWhisk on OpenShift. That, that already works well. Uh, there is Project Odd, which provides templates for this, and it makes deploying OpenWhisk on OpenShift or also Kubernetes pretty straightforward. There's also an Ansible Playbook bundle. Um, you can use that to deploy OpenWhisk to the service catalog and then provision it via one click from the service catalog. This one is experimental, but it works. Um, that's OK, but we want to go one step further. Uh, we want to manage or we want to represent OpenWhisk resources in OpenShift. So we want to represent our actions in OpenShift. Um, and we want to manage them using templates, using the YAML templates that OpenShift and Kubernetes use. Um, and we want to give you a sensible way to retrieve all the necessary data you need to invoke those actions, like credentials and uh, endpoints. The question is, why, why would you want to do this? Uh, there are several reasons. Um, first one, operational reasons. So it's possible that you have cluster admins that know how to deal with OpenShift. They know how to work with templates, but they should not have to know about how to deal with OpenWhisk and the CLI. So by giving them um, OpenShift templates or Kubernetes templates, they can just use their existing knowledge and apply that to work with OpenWhisk resources. It's also possible that some applications in your cluster depend on actions that are available at deploy time. So when you have templates, you can just bundle all your templates and deploy them at once, and that guarantees you that, okay, when my application runs, those actions will be available. Um, then there are security reasons. You might want to restrict uh, the CLI access to your cluster, because to do that, you would have to give out credentials. And it might be more sensible to rely on OpenShift OAuth for all authentication. And then there are some user experience reasons. So you might want to take advantage of things like the service catalog or service bindings to provide more advanced features. OK, how do we do this? Uh, we are going to use operators. So what's an operator? Uh, I, I've taken this from the CoreOS website. And it says, an operator is a method of packaging, deploying, and managing a Kubernetes application. A Kubernetes application is an application that is both deployed to, deployed to Kubernetes and managed using the Kubernetes APIs and kubectl tooling. We are particularly interested in the managing aspect here. So let's go a bit into details. Um, operators are applications embedded into your namespace. They are typically written using Golang because that's what Kubernetes and OpenShift are also written in. Um, they watch your resources, so everything that's deployed to your namespace, like pods, deployments, routes, and services, and they react to changes. Um, you can use custom types, and we are going to use custom types to represent OpenWhisk types like actions. So Kubernetes gives you this ability to, defi so to define types that are not known to Kubernetes, but are custom resource definitions. And we, I, I will show you an example of that later. Um, and there's also the CoreOS operator SDK, and this was announced recent, or pretty recently, and it provides a pretty good way to start developing operators. It, it's a nice SDK that abstracts away a lot of the nasty things of the Kubernetes API. Okay, um, we're going to work on the serverless operator, and I mentioned the custom resource definition. We want we want to have a custom resource that represents an OpenWhisk action. This is how this template would look like. So you, we say that our custom resource definition is called serverless action. And that's more or less all we have to provide. The rest is pretty standard. So you don't define here what the content of this custom resource will be. 
um, that's handled later. You just with this, you just tell your your OpenShift or your Kubernetes, hey, I want to have a resource called serverless action, and I want to make the cluster aware of this. Um, we also ha in the operator we have to represent this custom resource as type um, in GoLang. So, do I have a mouse? Nope. Um, what we have is. We define the type serverless action, which represents our resource. It has a, a spec part and a status part. The spec is basically, what do I need to create an open whisk action? So I need a name. I need to tell what the name of the action is. I need a kind. Is it Node.js? Is it Golang? I need to write the code that I want to run, of course. Um, then I have a username and a password here. Um, so open whisk is protected by its own authentication that I need to provide, and then we have a namespace. And then we have the status struct here. This basically stores what is the status of this resource. In this case, we only have, is it created or not? And in the next slide, we'll go into a bit more detail to make sense of why we need the status here. So um, the reconciliation loop, so how do operators actually work? They don't really react to events. They implement something called a reconciliation loop, and in every iteration of this loop, they are presented with all your, with all the watched resources. And it's then the job of the operator to sync the status of a resource with the managed service. So in that case, we have only a status created or not created. If the operator would see a resource uh, that is there, but has the status not created false. It knows, hey, I have to do something. I have to create this on OpenWhisk now, and then update the status. Uh, one could say that operator, an operator is basically a state machine for um, OpenShift Kubernetes resources. OK. Uh, this should help us understand a bit of the code here. This is taken from the serverless operator. It's a bit simplified. But the first part of this is watch the, what we have to tell the operator what kind of resources it should watch. In this case, we only care about the serverless action. So we tell the operator, hey, watch this resource, and then we hand over to the handler. And in the second part, we have to implement the handle function. So this will be called in every iteration of the reconciliation loop. And here we get the resource that is currently being watched. So first thing we do is we make a copy of this resource. It's called event, which is a bit misleading because this actually contains the, the resource itself. First we make a copy of it because it's a pointer, and it's a pointer to a live Kubernetes object that is possibly watched by other operators or services as well. Um, then we check the deletion timestamp, and if it's set, we delete the action. The way this works is, in Kubernetes, when you delete a resource, it's either deleted immediately, or if there is a finalizer attached to the resource, uh, Kubernetes will set the deletion timestamp and it will not attempt to delete the resource until the finalizer is removed. Um, otherwise, if no deletion timestamp is set, we, ch we check the status. If status created is true, we do nothing, because, OK, this action is there, it's not deleted, and it's already created. We can ignore it. If created is false, then we just create the action. This is calling out to OpenWhisk using its REST API to create the action. OK, it's demo time. So let's create an action. We have the, OK, let me show you that. We've deployed OpenWhisk here in namespace. And you can see there's also the serverless operator deployed. When we go to resources, other resources, we now get the type serverless action. That's what our custom resource definition added. We can see there is already one action, test action. Uh, now let's create another one. Let's have a look at the action that we're going to create. So this is a template of kind serverless action. That means it, it belongs to the type of the custom resource definition that we added earlier to the cluster. We have to give it a name. 
the, ter the resource itself, and we also have to give the, the action on OpenWhisk a name. We just say that this is a Node.js application, or a function. This is the code that it should run. And here we provide the user or the credentials to um, add this to OpenWhisk. If you're concerned about this and you don't want to give out those credentials, you could also make it known only to the operator by storing it in a secret, for example. So then um, the operator would just take those params and apply the credentials only when it's making a request to OpenWhisk. Uh, and finally, we have the namespace. Um, underscore means in OpenWhisk, move it up, just put it into the default namespace, whatever that is. Okay, let's create this thing now. Uh, I just used the OCCLI, so the OpenShift CLI, to create this action by providing the template. It says created. Let's check. Okay, there is test action two now. So now we've created an action on, on OpenWhisk, and it's represented in OpenShift. Give me back to the slides. Okay, and yeah, with this I would hand over to David for the Android part. Just let me. Thanks, Peter. Um, let's get the mouse over there. Okay. We're good. Okay. So, if you want to, if you want to call the service from a mobile app, um, the first thing you might be thinking is, okay, I need, I need some sort of SDK, perhaps, to call it, um, or kind of just make a simple HTTP request. But you also need some details of of uh, the thing that you're actually calling. So, you need some sort of configuration. So that's the first the first area I looked at. Um, the the serverless action. How is that represented in OpenShift? What can I get from OpenShift? And how can I make that available to the mobile app? In this case, it's a simple Android app. How can I make that available to the Android app in a way that it can it can actually make a call to the action? Um, so. What I'm trying to show on this slide is if we just get that serverless action, the custom resource, there's a lot of stuff in there, um, and we don't want all that. So we, we can slim this down. Um, so on the right-hand side, just to, just to get a bird's-eye view of, of, of the amount of stuff in there. So as a mobile developer, I don't care about all that. Uh, I, I just want the very important bits, well, what URL do I need to call? Uh, do I need any credentials for that? Um, so. A little bit messy, but we're, we're, we're getting there. We can, we can do an OC get command, pass in a template string, and the important bit is what we actually get out. So we get the host. Here's where our OpenWhisk server is. Uh, there's the action name, the namespace, and credentials. So that's, that's more usable in our app. So we can, we can use that, pull it down, put it into, into a JSON file. Uh, the mobile app itself, uh, I'll, I'll show some of this in Android Studio, but just to give an idea before we jump in, it's a simple example app. Um, it just has one action for calling the serverless action. Don't expect anything magnificent looking. Uh, so repos up there. If anyone does like to make things look nice, by all means, go ahead. Uh, create a PR. So we have a module in there for the OpenWhisk client. Um, that abstracts away the bit that actually talks to OpenWhisk. We read in the OpenWhisk config from uh, a JSON file. So using the command in the previous slide, we can just dump that out to a JSON file, make sure it's in that location there. In, in our app then, in our, in our activity, we can create a new OpenWhisk client from this config, and then using that client, we can invoke actions. Uh, so nothing too fancy there. Okay, to the studio, let's have a look at this code. Okay, I'll walk through right from the config to calling the action. And if anyone has any questions or wants me to explain a bit of code somewhere, uh, just shout. So first of all, this is in assets openwist.json. That's what we saw the output of the OC command before was, location of, of, uh, of uh, openwisk, uh, action name, and credentials. 
Uh, where is this used? In our main activity, if we look up the top here, uh, we are just going to parse in that config here, uh, create a new open with client from that. And please ignore the line that talks about SSL certs and New Kingdom. Uh, that's only temporary. Uh, so we have our open with client at this stage. What can we do with that? Well, down here uh, in our on click handler, so this app is very simple, has one button. In our on, cl on click handler for that, we will construct some params that we want to send to this action, um, pass it along. So th th this particular action that we created, it takes in a name and a place. So name, we'll say world, place is Boston. And it'll respond with a string that includes those words in, in, in some place. Uh, just down a bit further then, client.invoke. So the client's already set up and knows where to talk to. Currently, you have to pass in the action name. I have some ideas of making that much nicer. I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Anyways, client.invoke, that's the action name. Pass in those params and we'll get a response back. And all we'll do here is just update our text view to set the text just above the button to say whatever we've got back from that serverless action. Um, I'll jump into the invoke function as well, just to show there's nothing special in here either. So this is using the volley uh, HTTP request library. Setting up a new queue, format the URL based on the various configurations, so the host, the namespace, the action name, uh, then we set up this new JSON object request, pass in the params, uh, make sure we set the headers here for basic auth, and that just adds it to the queue for volley down here at the bottom. So nothing special here, it's just a HTTP request. Um, lots of potential for make, making this nicer for the mobile developer, but uh, simple for now. So eventually that will come back in here to the we update our text view with the with the text. Uh, so let's let's give this a spin and just show that it does actually work. So we should have should have the emulator running here. Perfect. You might have to. Okay. Button text goes up here. Super exciting. Call action. Hello world from Boston. There we go. Peter did all the hard work. I just did the small bit that looks impressive at the end. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's pretty much the end to end. Um, I'll say a few things of how I think we can improve this, though, because uh, there is there is plenty of scope there. So, uh, simpler configuration. So, one thing we didn't cover is what if you create more actions? And I want to call all these actions from my mobile app. Currently, that would mean a custom resource for each one. How can we bring that all together in one JSON config file? Uh, I think, Peter, you mentioned about uh, abstracting away the credentials to a secret. Yeah. Yep. So. so, for security reasons, you might want to do that. Also, for s s simplification of the configuration, just keep it in one place, and then the app knows where you can get that. Um, speaking from strictly Android point of view, uh, Gradle or build time plugins could really help here. So one idea is to get a plugin that uh, at build time pulls down the latest config from OpenShift for you, rather than you having to remember or script that uh, horrible OC command. Um, also a nice plugin, uh, this is one that I've uh, been inspired from the Apollo client, the GraphQL client, if anyone's familiar with, with the Apollo libraries. But generating types or classes at build time that map to the service actions. Um, so you could do something like that. My custom action done invoke, and there's type checking on that. And if, you're, if that action doesn't actually exist, there won't be a type there. So much safer for programming. Um, and in integrations, I think this is where the most interesting bit is. Um, how can how can we get the mobile bit integrating with more true OpenWhisk? How can we get OpenWhisk integrating with more things in general? So uh, mobile security that's a big that's a big feature of uh, so the Aragear community, the Aragear SDK. 
uh, integrating with Keycloak. So what can we bring in there so only the right people are authorised to call call particular actions? I know OpenWhisk has its own credentials, but can we bring Keycloak into play to keep them, uh, keep it more centralised as part of a larger project? Uh, server side or serverless side, whatever you want to call it, integrations using uh, so something like uh, if people have used Fuse or Synthesis, um, it's where the idea is you have these connections that can connect to different services, many, many different types of services, and you integrate them or tie them together in some sort of filtering or data mapping uh, through, through the UI. So server, serverless actions could feed into that, um, and possibly at the other end you could have something like a, a, a messaging queue and yeah, hook them up together. Um, third point, uh, OpenShift UI extensions. This is something, uh, as part of the AirGear work, uh, we would have experimented a good bit with uh, OpenShift 3.10, 3 and, uh, uh, and, uh, and we're looking to the future with OpenShift 4 as well, uh, because it's changing somewhat. But how can uh, the OpenShift UI, how can it be, be made aware that OpenWhisk is running here, and there are actions created, well, the custom resource, they can tell you that, and then showing that in the UI in some really nice way, um, so you can have a unified view of your project within OpenShift. So if you can see your serverless actions, and you have other things running, you can see all those things as well, and possibly even visualize uh, all these things uh, working together as part of a larger project. Um, so that's it on the future potential. Uh, I'll hand it back to you, Peter, if you want to do a bit of a wrap-up. Um, maybe to show you one more thing. Um, so we've seen that the the resources have been created here. What what does the resource actually look like? We can just inspect the YAML source of this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's hard to read from here. Um, is that okay to read? I try to. Yeah. So this is what what the YAML representation of our OpenWhisk action now looks like. We can see that it's of type serverless actions and, and that it has a number of annotations. Uh, those are put here by the serverless operator. Um, one thing it does is it annotates the resource with the endpoint of the actual action in OpenWhisk and it provides those properties also standalone. So you have the host, the name, the namespace and this is used in, in David's app so it this is parsed out and put into a JSON file. Um, then we can also see the finalizer here. So when we create an action, we add this finalizer. Uh, yeah, we add this finalizer to the resource, so that when you delete the resource in OpenShift, it's not deleted straight away, but the the operator gets notified and it can do its cleanup. Where cleanup means remove the action from OpenWhisk, then remove the finalizer, and then OpenShift can finally delete the resource. Um, and then we see the spec part. Um, this is what we talked about in... Let me find my mouse cursor. Whoa, there. A few slides back. So if we look at that code, this is exactly what we read out. So name, kind, code, and so on. This is what we read from the YAML definition. Yep, stored here. And the status. In that case, the action is already created, so the operator will just skip it. That was just to show you how it actually looks like on OpenShift when we created an action. And then back to the presentation. Just a quick reca recap of what we did. So um, we have OpenWhisk running on OpenShift. We didn't do much here because that already worked, thanks to Project Odd. Um, we have now an operator that manages our actions. We can interact with this operator by creating instances of custom resources. We can retrieve this configuration using the OpenShift CLI tools. And this configura configuration is then consumed in an Android app, and this Android app can use this configuration to also invoke the action. Um, the code to all of this is available here, so you can have a look at the operator itself. It's using the operator SDK. 
Um, here's the repository, and we also have the repository of David's Android app here. Yep, that's it. Thank you very much. So the first one, oh, go ahead. Yeah, the first one is you mentioned like uh, Lambda, for example, and support for the same type of languages. For example, let's say Node.js, which is commonly used. How easy is it to port the code over to uh, uh, to Open Wiscon, Open on Open Shift? You mean you, how easy would it be? So if I can just take, the, can I just take the code from Lambda and plug it in, and would it just work out of the box? I'm, I'm not. I have to say I'm not familiar with Lambda, but OpenWhisk takes in in the most simple case, it just takes a function without any dependencies. So you, if you have something like that running on Lambda, I would imagine that you can just take it and deploy it to OpenWhisk. That would work. I'm not sure how Lambda deals with uh, bundles, so where you have an action with dependencies added to it. Well, so you just upload a zip file, the same, same as here. Yeah. Okay. And then you tell it what language, what uh, what runtime version, and so on. Yeah. Um, can I just ask one sure. more question? So on, uh, so a related question. So on the, so, so the zip file that you upload. Uh, so there is, for example, so using your same thing. Let's say you have a MySQL database that you're uploading as a dependency, mm -hmm. but you don't want to create the connection pool every time for your serverless request. What are best practices for making sure they persist over multiple uh, multiple serverless requests? I'm, I'm not sure if in that scenario serverless is the best approach. Uh, it's it's best suited to best to stateless, um, and then to maybe actions that do simple transactions with a database. But if you have a if you have a, a connection pool and you're doing frequent database transactions, maybe a standalone service is a better solution. Um, but that's just my take on it. Um, what what I tried was to add the. Yeah, I added. I had an action that I and I used dependencies to talk with their Google Home, and I just I, yeah, it's just I downloaded the Node dependencies, bundled everything into a zip, and that worked fine. But I sorry, I can't really tell you how to deal with um, database connection calls. Thank you. Go ahead. We have a short time. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, uh, uh, we all use the open source serverless framework uh, to support. Uh, function as a service, such as the OpenWix and Kubernetes uh, or sign as a framework. So it's a special reason why we use the OpenWix in OpenShift. Don't consider it as uh, open source framework. Do you mean why do we want to run OpenWisk on OpenShift? And yeah, yes, yeah, rather than other kind of... Uh, oh, yeah, service. this I can go back to the, to the slide. Oh, sorry. No, that's, that means, yeah, the idea is that when you, usually you interact with OpenWisk through your CLI, and you need credentials to do that. Um, and the idea is, imagine you have a large Kubernetes cluster, and you have an admin that knows how to work with this cluster, work with templates, but he shouldn't have to know about OpenWisk. And that's the idea. You, uh, this administrator can apply his existing knowledge about templates and just apply it to OpenWisk. He can use those templates to interact with OpenWisk. That's kind of the idea, giving a, a more general way of interacting with your services. Okay. That, that's it answer the question. Or? I think that uh, in the new future, it could be incorporated some other uh, assemblies from uh, in, uh, beyond the uh, OpenWisk, right? Is in the future, does OpenShift have plan to adopt oh. some as? Uh, so some. this is purely experimental. Okay. There, there, this is not a product, and um, I, I don't know if there will oh, be. Okay. A, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. We have two minutes left. Uh, keep it very short. Uh, my question will be short. Um, it, it, Instinctually, if you have a, um, uh, you're building an application, an Android application, and you're deciding whether or not a serverless backend is uh, the right option for you, uh, just by what metrics do you make that decision uh, versus a standalone service? So I, I think that if you have stateless transactions where you just want to do some kind of computation on the backend, 
that's a pretty good use case for serverless. If you do have something like do simple lookups that involve maybe a dependency to a database but not much much else, this also might be a good solution for serverless. Everything more complex, especially everything that needs routing or, or has different in, or implements different kinds of intents, um, is probably better suited as a standalone service. Or David, would that be your view as well? Yeah, that, that's pretty much my view as well. Uh, I just wanted to add that sometimes your choice might, not, might be there as well. In that, uh, like if, you, if you're using uh, if you're using serverless on AWS, then it's it's all managed for you. But if you're talking about on premise. Um, do you have that team to manage an OpenWhisk cluster or not? In which case, it's just ruled out completely. Do your own app and manage that. I, I can give you maybe one practical example that we is. Have to, we have to wrap it up. Okay. Or we can talk after. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, we can we can okay. talk after. Yeah, sure. Sorry about that, but it's a very tight. Story. No, that's fine. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.